Great. Welcome everyone to the fourth working session of TADWIG 2020, an intro to TADWIG. I have the pleasure of starting us out with a welcome to the intro to TADWIG. Um, we want to say a warm welcome to those who are new to TADWIG or have joined for the very first time, and also welcome to many familiar faces in the room. Um, we do have a few TADWIG members joining us today to help welcome our new community. So we ask that you please say, say hello in the chat and help us with questions and discussions throughout the session. My name's Holly Little. I'm joining from Alexandria, Virginia in the United States. I work at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History and I'm also the North American representative on the TADWIG executive. This session is being recorded for later viewing. Um, our sessions this week will all run as Zoom meetings rather than Zoom webinars. This means that you can see the other people on the call, chat with them, and interact, and we highly encourage you to do so. Um, the chat function has been made available for questions or for, com for conversing with other attendees, but please use the chat function well as any inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or having your chat function being disabled. We will be operating according to our code of conduct that someone will be linking in the chat in case you need to refer to it. Please keep microphones muted. Um, we will have discussion time and you can unmute yourself if you'd like to speak up then, but if you're not talking, please keep yourselves muted. Um, this is our very first day of the conference, so please bear with any technical difficulties we may have. But otherwise, let's get started. So a quick outline for this talk. Um, today we're focusing on the organization that is TADWIG. We'll describe to you how, who is involved, what we do. We also will talk a little bit about the conference and provide some details about TADWIG 2020. Uh, the photograph here on the slide is an image from the conference last year in Leiden in the Netherlands, where there was an attendance over about, of, over about 600 people. Um, for this session of Intro to Tadwig, there was an early one this morning, so Ellie joined us then, but she is probably asleep right now. Um, we are trying to cover as many time zones as possible. Um, after you've heard from me, I'll be very pleased to introduce Marika Peterson speaking to you from Germany, Paula Zermoglio, who is attending virtually from Argentina, and James Macklin and Deb Paul, James coming from Canada, and Deb also coming from the U.S. We're also very grateful for the support from Gail and William who are keeping the meeting running and will be assisting with questions as well. Uh, so a few logis logistics for the session. Um, we'll have four talks. Each talk is 10 minutes of one of us talking and then five minutes for any questions you might have as we transition to the next person. At the end of the presentations, we'll have plenty of time for further discussion. We also have started a shared document you can find at the link that is on the slide and will also be added to the chat. We'd love it if you could start to contribute. For example, leave a note in the document to say where you're joining us from. You'll see there's a welcome poll there for you to add to. You can add a plus one if your location is already listed. Uh, to anyone that may have issues accessing Google and using the Google Doc, we're, we apologize, but please utilize the chat and Zoom. We're happy to hear from you in both places. For ongoing communication with Tadwig, you can use our Twitter handle or check Facebook. So let's dive into what Tadwig is. Historically known as the Taxonomic Databases Working Group, today's Biodiversity Information Standards, or still Tadwig for short, has grown to encompass much more than the original 1985 group. We are not-for-profit scientific and education association focused on establishing international collaboration among anyone interested in biodiversity information. Our core work is of course the development of standards used to promote wider and more effective dissemination and interoperability of that information. But it's not just standards, it's also implementation and adoption as well as expanding to the wider biodiversity informatics community. If you wanna learn more, you can visit our website at tadwig.org. Um, what you've most likely heard from of TADWIG, though, are standards like Darwin Core and ABCD. In simple terms, these describe 
the what, when, and where of a species occurrence record. What is the organism identified as? Where was it found? And when was it found? But that's all I'll say about standards, as standards is the topic from Marika's talk coming up next. So that's what Tadwig does, but who is Tadwig? The work of Tadwig requires participation by and collaboration with people from many domains, even beyond typical bio or geoscience disciplines. That overlap of disciplines and exchange of ideas from various perspectives is a big part of who Tadwig is. The Tadwig structure and is governed by an executive committee. So the Tadwig's, Tadwig's mission, structure, membership, and governance. Members elect officers to an executive committee, which then manages the organization. Many of these people are in the session with us today, depending on time zones. Perhaps they will now identify themselves in the chat so you know who else you might ask questions of. And you'll also see some of them pop up in later slides. We've tried to tag them in any pictures that show up. And then of course, you'll hear from our chair, James Macklin and deputy chair, Deb Paul later. Alongside the office bearers, Tadwick has regional representatives. Some key members that you might connect with as you begin your Tadwig journey are these regional reps. As I said at the start, I'm the rep for North America and Paula is the rep for Latin America. Please feel free to reach out to them. You can see their emails are here and you do have access to these slides through a link in that shared notes document for later. In addition to the executive committee, the work of Tadwig is done and maintained by the interest groups and task groups. Paula will share more details about those in her talk. And of course, it's members. In typical years, you might have become a member during the conference registration process. We hope that despite the change of venue, you'll consider a membership with Tadwig this year as well. You can become an individual member or your institution might want to join. A link to some of the membership info will also be added to the chat. But you don't have to be a member to participate. Before we showed a diagram with bubbles of, of the intersecting domains of Tadwig, in reality, that was a really simplified view of the Tadwig web. In this network di diagram, each node here is a person and their connections based on previous Tadwig abstracts. You can see it gets much more complex and really big. Community collaboration is essential to Tadwig and our community extends far beyond formal membership. Tadwig is a volunteer driven organization that continues to strive to be welcoming and inclusive. It is vital that Tadwig actively engage with the individuals, projects, and institutions that utilize and contribute to the standards, best practices, and tools developed and maintained by Tadwig. We need to have perspectives from all across the biodiversity and geodiversity landscape. We also want to create an environment that fosters innovation and learning. Tadwig really does grow with its community. One of the best ways to do that is to attend the conferences. So Tadwig has an annual conference that's usually held around this time of year and occupies a full work week. Our annual biodiversity information standards conferences serve two purposes, to provide a forum for developing, refining, and extending standards in response to new challenges and opportunities, which is a lot of what this current week for this year's conference is about, and to provide a showcase for biodiversity informatics, much of which relies on the standards created by Tadwig and other organizations. Tadwig also has a journal, Biodiversity Information Science and Standards, um, which is one of the advantages of attending the conference because we publish all abstracts in, a, in the journal. All the abstracts are peer reviewed and that project has been going on in the background for the second half of this meeting that we hope you'll attend in October. All the abstracts get a DOI and slide decks, posters and videos can be attached to create a lasting record of your participation. Since we are virtual this year, the format has changed somewhat, but the goals are the same. We hope that you'll join us throughout. James will share a bit more detail about our conference theme for this year, integrating data from local to global solutions in a bit. And although we're not in person this year, we hope you can still, we can still provide a place for you to engage in discussion this week and connect with some of your peers.
that's all for me for now. Do we have any questions yet? Doesn't look like it. Well, we encourage you to think on what your questions might be and we're ready to answer them when you have them. But for now, we can switch to Marika. We can't hear you. Now? Yes. Yay. OK. <laughs> yeah. I tried to have a, several headsets. and OK. But now it's going fine. OK. Um, yes. Um, welcome from Berlin. And I will um, share my screen and talk a bit about um, standards, uh, what they are, uh, what they can be used for, and how the development um, it's going on actually in Tedwig. So what is a standard? If you um, Google standard, the word, um, you might reach those kind of um, image of an old car from, I think it's 36, or maybe also other things like a bar. And, right, but also, uh, yes? We're not seeing you advancing your slides again. <laughs> I. Sorry, there's, now we can see it. <laughs> You see nothing or? We can see it, it's just in the browser window. Okay. And it was stuck on the title slide. Now? I've had that. You see it now? Advancing? No. That's do weird. You, do you have two screens? It's. No, I have just one single screen. <laughs> so. Do you want one of us to share it? I would try it once again, but, okay. I, but then maybe yes. Um, uh, leave it in presentation mode, Marika, and then do the share and it might show you two screens and select the one that's the full screen one. Mm. It's a bit tricky that way. Mm. Or maybe Holly, can you share? <laughs> Coming right up. Look good. It's still arriving. Oh, there it is. Looks great. Okay. Yeah, just proceed. Just go to the third slide. Okay. Next one. Can you give the control to Mike? Yeah, let's try giving her the control, Holly. My computer yeah. blocks it. Oh, that's right. Your computer blocks it. Oh, I <laughs> Okay. I can hit. Just say technical Nick. issues, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, but, um, of course, there are um, different meanings of the word standard, but when we are talking about standard, we are talking about an established norm. Next slide, please. So a technical standard is an established norm or requirement in regard to technical systems. It is usually a formal document that establishes uniform engineering or technical criteria, methods, processes, and practices. When it's coming to data, it's actually just, it's just a data scheme which is universally uh, comprehensible. And when it's um, coming down to metadata, so the data about data, it's a common understanding um, of the meaning or of the semantics of the data. This ensures a correct and proper use and interpretation by the data owner, but also, of course, by the users. Next slide, please. Next one. So what are they actually used for? If you have data stored in a database, a collection management system, access spreadsheet, CSV files, next slide, please. 
you can use the data standard simply to publish, next slide, um, your data and exchanges with colleagues. So data sharing, publishing, um, do some common quality checks and data analysis. So it's not that you can understand your data, the, what the meaning of your column in your Excel spreadsheet is, but others do it also, also like computers do. So that's really, really helpful. Next slide, please. Um, of course, there are organizations, international organizations, um, coping with data standards. Um, I think the best known might be W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. And they are tackling all standards um, under the World Wide Web. And we are having TEDRIC, this organization, which we are presenting here this week or in this uh, session. And they are dedicated uh, for the developing for biodiversity information standards. But there are, of course, more um, organizations um, worldwide. Next slide, please. So if you think of the development of a standard, it's not that you can just simply announce it. Um, there are standards out there and um, we need to um, carefully check if a new data standard is really needed. But so somebody might come up with an idea and because there are um, some data he would like to work with or publish and he doesn't find any data standard. So then he can create together with some colleagues an interest group and they are writing a charter with the objectives um, this entire group interest group is tackling. I don't want to go too much in detail into interest group and task groups because Paula will um, give you more details on this in her talk. Out of this interest group, a task group is created and they are writing a charter themselves for their particular task, like the development of a standard. This is then somehow reviewed by the technical architecture group so that um, they align, that this standard development is aligned with other developments by TEDWIC and then you can create a standard um, publish it on GitHub which is the usual platform TEDWIC is working with and then the ratification process can start. Next slide please. So um, I don't want to go too much in detail but the ratification itself is a, is a long process and different people are involved like the actual committee but also we have two um, big important reviews one is an expert review where you have some experts which are invited like for a peer review article compared to that but then you also have a public review for um, four weeks where everybody who's interested in the standard development can contribute and comment on that next slide please and if and in, in the end, if everybody agrees, um, uh, a new standard is accepted. And um, of course, there's usually some maintenance going on. And at some point, the standard might be somehow outdated and can be uh, retired. Next slide, please. Um, Holly already mentioned that um, two main standards um, TEDWIC is working with, which are describing biodiversity observations, but as well collection objects. One is Darwin Core, and the second one is ABCD, access to biological collection data. And so here you can add information on record level. So what institution is holding it on the occurrence of um, that specimen in the wild, the location, the identification, so the taxonomic stuff you would like to add to this observation or to the specimen. You can find more information on the standard on both web pages, but as well, I can really recommend the Darwin Core Hour series for introduction to the standards, but also to other important topics. Next slide, please. But of course, TEDWIC is not um, only developing or maintaining those both standards. There are more. There's um, the G Global Genome Biodiversity Network, um, GGBN, which is working um, for genomic samples. And we have the Audubon Core when it's coming to media. They just had their meeting earlier today. And then um, we have the collection description standard. They already met also today. And they are. Um, describing collection on a higher level. So not on a level of the specimen, but on a higher one. And here you can see um, on the Chadwick 
web page um, information about more standards and also the second link gives you an idea of other metadata standards um, on uh, developed by Tedwick but also beyond. Next slide please. So but uh, if you have you don't need to uh, work with all different data standards. Usually, if you have one type of data, one is even enough. Like if you are using ABCD or Darwin Core, you can publish your data in different um, portals and therewith you can reach different people. So you can reach like researchers um, like this GFBio is a German portal for biological research data. You can um, reach the broader public um, by um, publishing images uh, using the digital European library Europeana or also like geological um, samples using geocase but and last but not least of course GBIF, GBIF the biggest um, portal for biodiversity information data. Next slide please. So here are the sessions which are um, of importance of uh, during this week, if you're interested in data standards. Um, the Monday sessions are already, um, took already place, but of course they are recorded. So if you're interested in it, just check the website and I'm sure you will find the recordings there in the upcoming days. And um, tomorrow there are three. One is in Darwin Core extension, how did it die? Then we have a meeting of uh, an alignment of ABCD and Darwin Core. And in the afternoon session, we have the science and paleobiology interest group here, also Darwin Core and the ABCD extension EFG is of importance. And on Wednesday, we have um, the MITS, the minimum information about digital specimen and the Darwin Core maintenance group. And on Friday, um, the Genomic Biodiversity Interest Group, so GGBN and beyond. Next slide, please. But also, although the program of uh, October is not um, announced in detail, there are several symposia which might be of interest for you. Yeah, with this, I would like to thank you. Thanks for sharing, Holly. <laughs> no problem. Um, do we have any questions yet? Just coming up with really good ones. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did make a note in there and wondering, and, and people know, um, as we go by those things, if you hear about a group that you're interested in, you know, please just ask us, and we will talk more about those groups for you. Great. Well, we can get started with Paula then. Okay. I uh, will share my screen. So let me know what you can see, please. Can you see my screen all right? Yep. I think we hear your computer fan in the background. I'm just okay. guessing. Oh, sorry. Just no, no, no fixing that now. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I'll try to speak loud. Is that any better? Yep, just go ahead. Okay, so, okay. Um, what I'm going to talk about now very briefly is about interest groups and task groups within Tadwick. As Holly and, and Marika already, already mentioned, these are the core groups that make our, our work, right? So what are really interest groups? And, and task groups. So they're basically groups of people, right, that want to do something about standards that have a particular need and that are willing to work towards developing or maintaining uh, biodiversity data standards. So these interest groups and task groups, task groups sorry, undertake the, the core function of, of Tadwick, that is that, developing and maintaining information, biodiversity information standards. 
So interest groups are groups that provide a base for discussing problems, understanding possible strategies and methods and application of technologies, right? And that set goals around standards and what to develop and, and how. And also the second, the second function that they have is to maintain the products of its past task groups. So task groups are groups within interest groups. And these groups are tasked to do something in particular in a specific time frame. So let, let's we, we can think about uh, a homework. So we build task groups to do something in particular within a bigger goal and umbrella uh, idea that is the interest group. And it, it's important to to mention that interest groups and task groups are first open to anyone and are built on the work of all the community. So we're going to see right now how is the process around building a, an interest group and task group very briefly. I'm not going to describe it in detail. So if you want to um, see the little bits and pieces of the process, I provide you there with a, with a URL to the process. And so interest groups and task groups are formed by building a, a charter, which is a document that establishes the goals of the group, how it's going to operate, what's the background that brings them to uh, that needing at the development or maintenance of, of a particular standard or best practice, and very important, determining how people can participate, how they can get engaged and work together in that interest group or task group to accomplish their goals. So in, in that charter is also declare who is going to coordinate a group and that will be the convener. There can be one convener or more than one. Some groups have co-conveners and then there is a list of core members. So core members are the people that are most engaged in the work of the interest group or task group and are the ones who do the work. Right. So we expect that in a list of core members, we would have people actually doing things. But then there is another piece that is the other members. Other members can be just anyone that is not necessarily listed on, on, on the charter, but that can contribute to the extent that they can and, and that they will. So no one needs to have any particular expertise in any particular standard to be involved with interest groups and task groups. If you're curious to know what an interest group or task group does, you just have to get in touch with the convener or the members and get to know what the activities are of that group and try to participate to the extent possible and try to share your expertise. So the idea behind it is that we will build something together, taking advantage of different perspectives and different expertise that everyone can bring to the table. So these groups and, and interest and uh, task groups, they present an annual report, which is e evaluated by, by the Tadwick Executive Committee, where they say what, have been, what has been the progress toward achieving the goals that they set in their, in their charter. So again, for details of the process, you can visit uh, the web page. Uh, so I'm going to go very, very quickly through only the names that I'm showing you here of the interest group that uh, TAWIC currently has. So right now we have 17 interest groups. I will show you two slides of them and I will not go into the details. Please go uh, yourself to see each one as, as as it interests you. So in these slides, you will see the little icons just below the pictures. Those globe icons mean that these groups have meetings during this week. So for example, we have a session for annotations for Audubon Core, that was this morning, for citizen science and, and so on. So some of these interest groups that I show you, here is the second page of it. They don't have meetings of the whole interest group, but still some of their task groups have meetings. So 
among these interest groups, I will want to mention that there are two, two kinds of interest groups. The normal interest group, and then there is the maintenance interest group. And those maintenance interest group, what they do is they are specifically tasked with maintaining already ratified standards. So that's their, their, their goal, they maintain. And currently, there are two maintenance groups that are the Audubon Core 1 and the Darwin Core 1. So, as said before, within interest groups, there might be zero to many task groups. So, task groups come and go. As, as I mentioned before, they do something, they accomplish something, and then they disappear. So, at, some, at any point in time, you might find that an interest group has no task groups or has many. So in here, I give you a list of the 12 task groups that we have approved right now, currently, plus another one that has not been approved yet, but we're hoping it's gonna happen soon and it's still having a, a session during this week. So again, I, I encourage you to go to the, the pages of each one, but I'm gonna show you just an example. So this is, uh, how the biodiversity data quality interest group looks like in the Tadwick webpage. So what we see there is elements from the, the charter of the group, the rationale, who are the conveners and the core members, how to become involved, how to participate. Then we have at the, at the right, we have the list of task groups that it has and each one of those has its own page as well. And I wanted to note to you that there is a link to a GitHub repository. So every interest group has a GitHub repository within the TAGWIG organization. So in there is that we manage our documents and, and that we develop the work towards uh, working, developing and maintaining the standards. So each interest group within its repository manages the documents slightly differently but know that that's the place probably to, to go to see the details of each group and their current activities. So a level up from the groups are those who oversee their activities. And those are on one hand the executive committee who evaluates the charters and annual reports and who can also structure groups to fit the priorities and the resources of TADWIC better. And then there is a technical architecture group who does the technical evaluation of the, of the charters and reports and who coordinates across interest groups. Right? It's no, it knows all the interest groups and tries to, to improve their communication and the, to cross fertilize uh, um, between them. So to kind of wrap up, here is a, a, a schedule of the interest groups and task groups that are meeting this week. So the first two for today have already passed in the morning or afternoon, depending where you are. Um, I invite you to look at the others and try to participate. Again, you don't need to be an expert to come and join us. So get in contact with the members, share your expertise, join the groups and maybe even propose your new interest groups or task groups as, as, as it follows your needs. So remember, that also our work is going to be reflected in the virtual conference. Keep that in mind for October. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. That was great. Um, we had a lot of great ideas for some new task groups this morning, so or some new interest groups. So please feel free to suggest some in the chat. Um, we did have one question, uh, which I think it might be a kind of weighty one, but it also leads very nicely into our last talk. Um, so I'm going to try to read it out uh, from Ian. It seems like TADWIG standards are sometimes pigeonholed as data exchange standards, only applicable at the end of the data management pipeline, when data leave an organization or a project to be shared on platforms like GBIF. My question is, how appropriate is it to be using or promoting these standards earlier in the data management process, for example, a database design or even sampling method design? Anyone want to tackle that? 
I think it's really up to pride to use it earlier. <laughs> Um, so we did it um, also in our institution, not really kind of also for database development, but having just some common spreadsheets when a collection does not have a database system. So then I'm just reusing some fields of ABCD or Darwin Corp because then the mapping is totally easy when it's coming to publishing. And also this will be one important topic of the Darwin Core and ABCD um, I think it's a working group meeting. I don't actually know by tomorrow uh, where we are talking about the alignment. So the different use cases of that standard. So um, if you're interested in this, come and um, join that meeting tomorrow. I think I would add um, it's important to Remember not to use those terms as a limit, though. So if you're if you're building a database and you use those as a guide to make it easier to do the communicating and, and have to do less mapping, et cetera, that they, they, they were never meant to be a set of terms that you would actually use to call the fields in your database. But if you do that, that's the, the main thing is you might have data that doesn't fit into a bucket in Darwin Core or ABCD. You might have something that there isn't a field for yet. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be sharing it. You want to share it and you find it important. And so that's where the, the, um, the coalition comes in, where you need to be able to say to the standards organization, hey, I have this data and it's important for people to need it. And I can't, I don't have a bucket here. There's no field that encompasses this concept. So as long as you use it as a, a, a guide, a framework, that's great, but not as a limit. Great, thank you. I imagine that discussion will continue because it definitely hits many parts of the process. Um, but perhaps for now we'll transition to James in the final talk. Alrighty, just let me share my screen here. Can people see that? Yep. Yes, I see some nodding yes. heads. That's good. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, as some of you know, uh, I am the current chair of TADWIG, so it's, uh, it's an exceptional pleasure to see so, uh, well, see faces, some names of so many people who are interested in, in the introduction to TADWIG. Uh, of course, we were really hoping that as a virtual, in its virtual sense, that we'd have more people who were able to join and, and get a feeling for what TADWIG is about. And hopefully someday when we get back to our in-person uh, conferences that uh, several of you will be able to join us as well or just continue to contribute in the background. Uh, I should say that uh, Deb Paul, the deputy chair of Tadwick, is uh, also lurking with me and uh, will probably interject here and there to uh, contribute to this talk. There she is, wait. Okay, so uh, I get to deal with the big picture. Uh, the big picture is where do the standards, what stands on the standards? Uh, so I get to talk about standards and their applications to data and towards the impl um, implementation of software uh, and, and how that uh, is supposed to work. So as a quick outline, I'll talk about our field or domain of biodiversity informatics. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the biodiversity knowledge graph, uh, the concept of an alliance, and then a little bit more about what to expect from the Tadwig 2020 conference coming up in October. So uh, in order to explain biodiversity informatics, I often use the uh, classic stool approach uh, where the standards are one of the three legs uh, that uh, the biodiversity informatics community sits on. So standards, of course, come along with the primary data. So you have your data providers, you have standardization of that data, and of course you need infrastructure and tools to help you manipulate that data uh, and make it usable. So biodiversity informatics can be seen as the seat. Uh, and so this is, again, a domain, a set of experts, of researchers uh, and implementers, and they rely on those three uh, legs in order to process that data and make it useful. And some of you are probably pretty familiar with FAIR. It's become a, a, a much talked about sort of set of principles for research data. Uh, and the idea is that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I think that's a fairly good summary of what we do. And 
once you get past us as the seat, uh, you come to the end users and the researchers, the people who need this data. And uh, the way we see this now is the data needs to be fit for their use or fit for their purpose. So one of our roles is to, through standards, make that data fit for the kinds of use that they need to be. It needs to be of high quality. These are the people who are looking at big research pictures like climate change, like uh, conservation, those types of things. And it's essential that they get the data that they need. So in a classic sense, and you've seen this a little bit, Tadwig has been, and, and biodiversity informatics is focused on observation. Uh, and that observation comes usually of two types. There's the observation that we see in the real world. And then some of that we capture and we keep a physical representation of, and that's why we have a close association with natural science collections. So we're really interested in the who, what, where, when, and how of the biodiversity that we see. And this is classic, has been going on for centuries. But technology being that what it is, we've really seen a strong advance in the kinds of biodiversity we're able to see better, to understand its function better, and to document. And so in recent years, there's been a deluge of data for us coming from at least two principal sources. One is the molecular-based sources, so things like DNA barcoding, uh, eDNA, metagenomics, uh, and then also the sensor-based, uh, which we're just starting to grapple with, uh, being things like remote sensing and their applications to biodiversity uh, and biologging. So I think the key point here is that because there's changes in technology, changes in what we're able to study, there also has to be a standardization process that follows this. So this is an evolution. Some of our standards need to be just tweaked or added to as things uh, become, as we're aware of more kinds of information. And in other times we need to invent completely new standards. Uh, from scratch. So it's an exciting place and there's a place for everyone in this. I use this just to get a sense of the big picture here in the of what biodiversity informatics is about. Um, and so this is something called the Global Biodiversity Informatics Outlook. It was developed a few years ago um, as a way to see uh, what the components are uh, and suggest how they link to each other. Uh, and you can see the data standards is on the bottom row uh, in the culture uh, category. Uh, but you look around that and you see many other kinds of information that are part of the uh, biodiversity informatics world and the tools that are necessary, et cetera. And I think the, the story here is that uh, even if you're not uh, a standards person per se, or perhaps don't want to be, there certainly is lots of room for you in all of these other places that need research, they need work, they need tools. Uh, and so this is a big, uh, big environment, big complex environment that we need all the help with we can get. So let's look a little bit at the biodiversity knowledge graph. This is a concept that comes from a few people, but Rod Page is uh, sort of the principal driver of this. It relies on the concept of linked data and, and sort of semantics but uh, it is a nice way to see and try to envision a future, uh, a future that all of us are sort of driving towards. And as you can see, at least in this diagram, center to all of this is the data standards and the ontologies or slash controlled vocabularies that are essential to making relationships between these different data types. And so uh, if we walk through this, you can see that there are different data types all around the outside, and I'm going to focus on those in the next slide. But the key concept is that from the bottom up, people, there are data providers. Those providers use our standards and protocols in order to put data into these data types and make them available. And in order to make the communication and the relationships between all of these, we need persistent identifiers. These are just pieces of infor unique information that allow us to track the provenance between all of these different data types uh, because those relationships are essential to talking about the kinds of science that we do. And you see on the outside different types of providers and users. These are the curators of the data. And these people are constantly giving us feedback in order to enrich that knowledge graph and allow us to mine it for new knowledge. If we look a little closer uh, at these different data types, what, we, what you can realize is that many of these are actually services to the community. So if you go from my right to left, 
Uh, over on the publication side, we're used to the data aggregators. So we have GBIF, we have iDigBio, we have the Atlas of Living Australia. And then we can add in the, the com literature component, by, for example, the Biodiversity Heritage uh, Library. We have traits. Uh, we have the nomenclators that provide the base taxonomic information. We have interpretations of that taxonomic in, um, information into catalogs. We have the collections-based information, people, places, institutions, in repositories. And we have, for example, sequence data uh, in places like NCBI and the BOLD systems. These are just a few examples going around that, uh, th those sets of data types. But what's critical is that we use these every day and we rely on them. So their sustainability and their quality is important to us. So what is that? Why do I say that? Well, I say that because uh, there's been struggles. Some of these, uh, well, several of these service, services come from projects. They come from projects in independent places that did a really great job at a very specific time. And unfortunately, those projects end. And when they end, those services are put at risk. And a lot of the community can be really uh, depending on them. So it became obvious to many of us uh, that there is a need for something like an alliance. Now that technology has driven us to be a more global economy and a global climate, we are able to work together better than we ever used to be. So many of these services and the kinds of things that we want can be no longer have to be done as independent projects uh, in smaller local places. They can be expanded into a global context. And the idea here is that if we can expand these into global contexts and many projects can contribute into one or entities can exist with a focus on that one thing to sustain that one thing, then we have a community of or a federation of those services that everybody can rely on. And Tadwig is one of those. So in the sense of the standards, Tadwig is dedicated to this cause because we know that our services are, are required. So this is a, a very important new um, alliance that uh, I hope all of you are able to follow. And the, uh, if you want more information about it, the alliance at the moment is driven by GBIF. So they have taken on the, the governance of this while we build it up. So switching now to talk a little bit about uh, what's gonna happen a month from now. So we have this sort of classic dichotomy in Tadwig, which we've had for a long time now. We are a standards body and we do very technical things in order to develop standards. And this week is very focused on that. You'll see those interest groups and task groups. Some of those discussions get very technical. They need to be uh, because standards in some cases are quite technical. That's okay. Um, but we rely on other people's use cases. So the reason to have all of you there is because there's always things we didn't think of or a use case we didn't know. Uh, this always happens. So you're all welcome to join in that part. Then there's a second part is the other part of Tadwig has become a sort of forum for biodiversity informatics. So we hold this conference every year and we try to do both things. We do both the standards development and biodiversity informatics. So the set, that second week really focuses on implementations and uses of standards. What are standards driving? And I think you'll see from the uh, symposia and other planned events there that that's really what it's about. And every year we try to have a theme. Now this theme was derived before COVID. So uh, we could have, of course, had some, some very different uh, ideas if, if that had happened first. But I like this, it's very, it's very general, integrating data from local to global solutions. And much of what I just said uh, has really focused on that. So everyone has their local needs, they have the local things, data that they need to work, do their jobs and local tools. But there's always more they need uh, and so they have requirements, they have ideas about what they'd like, but they can't do this themselves. So that comes out into the global picture. More people need those ideas, those services, and have those same requirements. And at a global level, we can try to deal with some of those, produce those services, find solutions, drive solutions through all of us. Those go back to the local, they try them out, they say, oh, but wouldn't it be great if this could happen too? Or I have a better idea how to enhance this. And that comes back to the global and we have this feedback loop so that both at the global level and the local level, we're as successful. And I think that's a, that's a really nice uh, way to focus uh, what we have going on in the month. So 
In October 19 to 23rd, um, we'll do the same thing. We felt strongly that concurrent sessions uh, is not the greatest thing to do when you're in a virtual uh, environment. We want to keep it simple. So we will space things out uh, so that we are able to have to span a single stream. But of course, in doing that, uh, we're going to have to look across a time span across many time zones. So some of you may be forced to get up a little early or stay up a little late or also we'll provide your recordings. So don't be afraid if you miss things, you can always come back to the recordings. And we're really excited that uh, we have two uh, plenary speakers. Uh, we're, we have Dr. Scott Edwards, who's a curator of ornithology at Harvard University. And uh, he uh, did something interesting. He decided that uh, during the COVID times to cycle across America. Uh, just curious about birds, really. Uh, but in the times of COVID, that was an interesting thing to decide to do. And it also was the times of Black Lives Matter and when all of those protests and that was really brought to the forefront. So Scott is going to have some really interesting words about this uh, that he learned across his journey across America. And I think it's going to be super interesting. Um, and then we have a speaker from iNaturalist as well. Most of you are familiar with iNet. Uh, it's hard not to be. It's the very successful citizen science identification platform and learning about biodiversity. And uh, we'll have a speaker there to introduce those of you who aren't familiar with it, but also to tell us about some of the cool techies things they're working on and more services that they're going to provide in the future. Uh, we have nine symposia, lots of open session talks as well. Uh, poster session and three different uh, panel discussions. And we're just in the process now of publishing the abstract. So you'll be able to see much of what is going to be talked about uh, in advance because those abstracts will be published in this, in our journal, which you heard about earlier. And we're not going to focus in on any of the symposia here, but just to say, you know, when you look across those talks, there are lots of things for lots of things for everybody here. But uh, data integration, data visualization is a big thing right now. Data interoperability, crucial. Sustainable development, a newer piece of that puzzle coming somewhat from the Alliance and just the need to keep these services around. And uh, something that's uh, really essential, sorry, well, I can't go back. Something that's really essential to us is uh, <laughs> the uh, concept of attribution and credit for, for the work that all of us do. So with that, I'll end. Uh, and I'd like to give uh, my colleague Deb a chance to uh, jump in here and chime in on anything that she feels is important that I skipped. Yes, the last part. Can you go back to the slide before the Alliance? Yeah, yeah. Right before the Alliance? Uh, no, beginning. Oh, well, no, okay. Right. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. That one. No, back. Oh. Nope, you can't go back. The one before the Alliance slide. This one. I think. Oh, before the Alliance. This one. That one. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so if you look at this at first, I just want to make it clear to everybody. Every time you try to do one of these diagrams and you're trying to represent some ideas here, you might recognize that each of you come to this from a different place. So you might recognize something, oh, that this is not on that graph or here's something I would add. And for me, what I think has become clear here is if you look at this graph and you ask yourself, where did the taxon concepts come from? Where did the collections come from? Where did the list of traits that we're interested in capturing and the data that goes with them come from? Right? Where does the interaction information about taxa come from? And of course, the answer is people, right? It's, it's people that do this work. But there's been this interesting dichotomy in the community between the need to capture the data, the, the who, what, sorry, the sort the what did we capture, where was it on the planet, wh when was it, um, and that information, and the who has been kind of um, left by the wayside until later, and, and it's just sort of in a sort of, I think, nice alignment, to use that term again, what has happened is now we have enough data in these large aggregated databases that we can go back and, and ask really great questions about the who now. And so by that, I mean, if you're a collector, if you have done identifications, if you are doing georeferences, if you're doing curatorial work of any kind, wouldn't it be great if you could get recognition and track sort of the use of those specimens and the derivative objects of those and the work, the intellectual capital that you are adding to this picture. And so this is just one example 
when you guys, are, when everybody's trying to understand what the heck these, all these identifiers will do for us in a sort of very practical example. How many of you today, I think maybe if you put in the chat for us an exclamation point, if you've never heard of bionomia, put an exclamation point. If you've never heard of that, and you don't know what I'm talking about. Cool, okay, goody. Lots of, lots of people to introduce to Bionomia briefly. So imagine you are going to GBIF or IDIGBio or your other favorite database and you are looking up uh, data taxonomically. So you're looking for your favorite species or uh, your, what organisms that exist uh, in a favorite uh, a part of the planet, the biogeography that you're interested in. But now you want to know something like, well, I either want to georeference this or I want to know who else collected with this person or I want to know um, where on the planet and who was interested in this and who they collected with. So for those of you who are familiar with Excel sheets, pivot tables, there you go, Jody. That's it. Only now uh, if we bring up Black Lives Matter and the need to be uh, inclusive and it's been rebranded as Bionomia because uh, you can go read more about on the, on the website why, why the rebranding, but yes. Uh, and so the goal there was to make it possible. And my favorite example currently is the georeferencing one. If I'm trying to georeference something and I have very little data, let's say it was a mammologist and this particular project we're doing involves georeferencing old legacy data for bat records. Well, a mammologist didn't only collect bats. They collected mice and other mammals. Well, maybe the mice collection has been digitized already and maybe it's been georeferenced. So if I can look up that person and I can see all the specimens they collected, and now I can see the georeferences for them. I know where they were in 1952 because there it is. And now I can inherit that georeference or at least some more information about that locality to apply to a bat that happened to be collected in a cave down the road from where the, um, the mouse was collected. So Think of that as a new sort of, um, if we have an X and a Y, maybe there's a Z axis on this diagram in front of us that involves people because they're gonna be connected to all of those. That's what I wanted to say there and hopefully to engage all of you in um, contributing to Bionomia and using it as a resource. Ooh, yes. Elizabeth, would you be willing to turn on your microphone and tell us about that? Please, if you're willing. Uh all right, that's a, a little bit of a surprise, but sure. Um, so I'm a staff curator at the University of Wyoming Museum of Vertebrates, and our museum collection is part of the Arctos collaboration. And the really, one of the really interesting things about Arctos for me has been the fact that we track agents um, across all the different collections and we share that information. So when I started out uh, as a graduate student, student at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. My catalog started there. And then um, when I prep things for other museums across Arctos, they don't create a new person. Instead, uh, they're able to link me to all the different collections that my specimens go to. But it's also been really interesting because we've been able to track uh, historical uh, people's collections as well. So one of the things uh, I like to do here at University of Wyoming is track where our um, agents have worked. Uh, so such as George Baxter, who was one of the big ichthyologists and herpetologists here at our museum. He's also contributed specimens down in Colorado uh, and has worked across many different collections. And so I provided a link in the chat for the Arctos database uh, search function for agents. So you can provide somebody's first name or last name and search across them. So we can talk, I can talk, we can talk about this for a long time. Thank you very much for being, for sharing that vision, Elizabeth. That's super appreciated. And so I would add one more layer to, to what Elizabeth was expressing is that all of us here, if we are the collector, if we are the person doing the determinations and we have an or ORCID ID, and we share that when we publish our data, we are helping this effort, and you will help yourself with that findable, accessible, interoperable part for getting credit. And what I would add to that is what we're, what we're really doing is taking all the people out of our databases that we hold individually, 
because we often have specimens from the same person across collections, right? And we're taking that out and making this huge giant resource that we can share across the whole planet if we do this right. And, and bionomia gives you a sense of how, how that could happen. And you can imagine we can then do that things with things like place names and, and uh, localities as well. So, um, like I said, I'm excited about that topic and I could go on more if you have more thoughts on that. I, I don't know if David Shorthouse is here, but we can uh, really ping him for questions and, and, and input if you want to know more on how to, how to contribute to this resource. So on that, um, I would, oh, thank you, Ian. Thank you from, from all of us. So um, Holly brought up a point that there's a question in the Google Doc. So I'm not how, sure how many of you are logged in there right now. And I think, Kali, you mean this one. Is there any initiative to provide easily accessible training or tools to enable researchers to be more active in creating, manipulating, and exploring biodiversity data? Um, and there's a reference here to, for many, uh, there, many people, it really results in a series of CSV files or spreadsheets, um, not linked data or um, structured data in XML or other structures. And is this outside the scope of TADWIG? It's not outside the scope in the sense that we, we have a biodiversity informatics curriculum group. I'm trying to remember the exact name. And we're interested in especially sort of coming up with what skills do people need and at least being able to point them toward resources. Many of us are involved, uh, as someone put here in the answer, the Carpentries. Is, uh, how about exclamation points again? Everybody, if you've never heard of the Carpentries, an exclamation point in the chat. So in brief, if somebody will put the carpentries.org, I think it is in the, put a link in the chat, that'd be great. So in brief, uh, there's a suite of uh, programs. One's called Software Carpentry, another one is Data Carpentry, another one is Library Carpentry, and there are, I think there's another one. Um, they are many things. One, they are two-day workshops. That's one thing they are to introduce people to skills that they need that are foundational to doing the kind of things we're talking about here. How to manage data, um, how to transform data from one format into another format, how to do things like use the command line, how to query your data using things like structured query language or R or Python. Um, in addition, they are a network. You can find inside that community all over the planet, it is global. You can find people to do workshops. You can find uh, an opportunity for yourself to become a, a Carpentries instructor. And when I say that, the cool part is you get trained in pedagogy. You are uh, how to teach this kind of information. And I think it, it's been one of my goals to take the Carpentries structure, which has mentoring, assessment, integration of pedagogy, and these foundational skills we need to manage data, both from uh, source to sink, um, to embed that, for example, in the museum community, so that there would be, and there's an example here, Holly, you have a group at the Smithsonian. Could you talk just briefly about that? Actually, Mike is in here, so if oh, he doesn't that's... mind me putting him on the spot. <laughs> Woohoo! Yes, Mike. I was scared you would do that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I just wanted to mention that there's there's a third Carpentries group that's slightly newer. There's Software Carpentry, Data Carpentry, and Library Carpentries, um, which is uh, the curriculum is a little bit closer to um, information science that uh, museums uh, work with a lot. Um, but yeah, we, we have been, um, the Smithsonian has been a member for two or three years now. And um, what that gets us is several um, trained instructors. Um, we put uh, now 15 Smithsonian employees through instructor training. And then once we have that pool of instructors, we're able to offer um, pretty customized uh, uh, data carpentry workshops mostly to other Smithsonian employees. And it's taught by Smithsonian employees and it's, it's a good feeling to connect with other groups. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. So, and I think a, a key point that Mike made there 
is this connecting groups and helping them become self-sustaining. So there's more than just sustainability of software, right? There's the sustainability of products and the sustainability of, of, the, of our community to help itself develop capacity. And this helps each community in and of itself, as we think of the Smithsonian as a community, to help upskill itself. And, and, but it's also a way in which the community can support each other. So if we all had this training across museums, uh, they're already doing this to a certain degree. In the Northeast, I think Harvard and a couple of the other universities, including y'all at the Smithsonian, are you, are you have a sort of a network agreement, sort of kind of, yeah, well, okay. Uh, but anyway, that's one of my visions. So I'm not sure who asked that question, but yes, we're interested. Yes, if you're interested, uh, talk with us about how, and that's where these biodiversity sort of informatics 101 type sessions come from a lot of us who are uh, at Tadwig for the last, like since 2017, I think, have been involved in this because we recognize the need for the bridge and skills between the people producing the data and the people using the data. And we're in between, as James so eloquently described, and providing the standards so all of that data uh, sharing can go on. Thanks, Deb. Um, yeah, and if you have ideas on how to tackle that, I think what we've really tried to hammer home in this session is bring your ideas and add your perspective because we need to hear from everyone. <laughs> um, we don't have any other active questions, I don't think. Um, anyone's welcome to raise their hand and speak up. I do have a filler thing we can do. Earlier in the first session today, we got to hear from a few other Tadwig members of their memories and um, what they treasure most about Tadwig. Um, and we heard from Arthur Chapman, a longtime member. So I'm curious if we have anyone here that would like to compete with Arthur in telling their stories of their joy of Tadwig. <laughs> I don't know who here has been around the longest. Well, if I had to vote for someone, uh, Holly, I, if Stan is is here, I think Stan should get some uh, get his chance. He's here. Stan, can you? Is it? There you are. You hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Um, I would only make one comment. Um, and that is, um, and, and it's actually to, to repeat what Bob Morris said years and years ago. Bob was a computer science uh, professor at University of Massachusetts, Boston. And, um, and he started coming to Tadwig when, um, when Tadwig came to Harvard uh, back in 99, I think it was. And he just, just kept with us, even though he wasn't you know, by training or by profession, very interested. Well, he was interested in, in nature, but his profession was mathematics and computer science. And he said, I come back to this organization all the time because it's one of the nicest communities I've ever participated in. The people are just really nice and really fun. And I appreciated that so much <laughs> to, you know, to hear from somebody from the outside you know, saying that, you know, they found this community really welcoming and, um, and, and very pleasant to be with. And so he, he kept participating as long as he was active professionally. So uh, that's one of my favorite memories. That's a great one, Stan. And, and if I can add to that, just because we're talking about Bob and what Bob has brought, I, uh, as, as a young, younger self applying for an NSF grant, uh, National Science Foundation grant, I got, uh, I got turned down the first time, which is very common. And they said, well, you know, you need some people who know something about computer science. Great idea, but you need help. And so when I went looking, uh, and I was at Harvard at the time, they said, oh, there's this guy, Bob Morris. Uh, you should talk to him. And so I, I did. And uh, my colleague, Paul Morris, who I don't know if he's lurking here right now or not, but anyway, we got together with Bob and, and had a discussion. This was about annotations and, and doing annotations, creating feedback loops for biodiversity data, which, of course, is still really timely. And uh, I remember meeting with Bob and Bob saying, well, you know, he listened to us and he looked at Paul and, and I and said, well, you know, you guys have to remember one thing. You're hacks. 
<laughs> and then we sort of looked at him and he said, you know, you have to take this from computer science principles and these have to be, you know, we have to do this in, in a solid way. Da, da, da. And, and uh, you know, we listened to him and we, we took his advice and we did get funded the next time, which was great. Uh, and Bob has helped us along uh, masterfully since then. I would like to qualify that I do not think Paul Morris is a hack. Paul has certainly become a technical expert uh, now, whereas I would certainly be called a hack. So, yes. Room for all levels of expertise here. <laughs> um, so we did have another uh, question in the chat. Are human remains and natural history museums included in the standards? And I will just note before we start, I think that that section of natural history, bringing in the cultural side and the geological side is a frontier that we are trying to work towards. Uh, but that's a little bit different than the question you asked. Yeah, yeah so I want to say in general, I would think that the standards as they are probably suit a lot already, but the problem is always comes in into sharing it. And, and generally a lot of that data is that that's the tricky part is to who to, who to share it with, where, when to share it, if to share it at all. That's, that's really the question, but I'm not sure about the first part, which is does the standard suit what you need to put in it. I don't know. Has anybody else here tackled that? I mean, I don't know, you don't necessarily share this data, but do you map it? I don't. Well, I like I think, David. Yeah. Go ahead, Holly. I was just going to add something about kind of similar to what David said, and he said it very well. So. <laughs> no, go ahead, because that's exactly what I was going to say. Okay. Well, David says in the chat, uh, data ethics has become a big topic in our world now. Maybe we need an interest group for this. And I was going to also suggest that. And I think there is a, a session in October that gets at this a bit with DEDNA. Um, so even if the standards apply, there's of course a lot of questions about what should and shouldn't be shared. Um, in many realms, we have a lot of data sensitive data sensitivity discussions, depending on which discipline you're working in. And of course, that's an interesting space because it doesn't, these things need, these data types need standardization. So I, I would sort of say what Deb does is that I think our standards are quite relevant. It's just that when you go to uh, walk away from the open piece of us and talk about data that's closed or generalized on purpose, and this touches geo-referencing, for instance. You know, we, in some circumstances, sensitive species, et cetera, we have to generalize. And what's important to us in our community is that if we do generalize, we're being honest about it, right? We, we say what our uncertainties are, and we're not trying to mask things that are, you know, not reproducible or mis are misleading. So our, I would say our standards are definitely applicable, but the implementation of that, the use of that, and what we're able to show about that, of course, will vary and is an ethical problem. Oh, thanks for the link. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Thanks, Gil. Mm -hmm. I, I would add from the other direction, um, and I, I learned this new word. This was a new word for me, maybe you all already know it. But um, certainly spinach, the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections is tackling this part of this issue now, not, not strictly this one, but this notion of sort of um, the way in which we've seen statues be removed or uh, re, so people are saying, oh, this person doesn't meet our current day morals, our current day standards. And um, so what are we going to do about that? And, you know, today in the future, today is going to be 200 years ago and we're going to be doing things that people through the filter of 200 years future uh, are not going to find acceptable. And, and so for me, for example, this is my personal bent. This is not, but this is my personal thing. To me, it's more important that we figure out how to recontextualize the information. So someone contacted me about their, um, the, the N word being on their herbarium labels and they're going to go back and particularly uh, like, cover that up. And in, in, in my mind, I would create a data set, work with the humanities or the departments at your universities and, and contextualize that as, you know, this was a term used to mean a color and it was used as the name of a lake or the name of a place or whatever. It was not meant 
strictly in a derogatory fashion, today it's found to be unacceptable, but we don't want it to disappear either. So, so there's this, how do we deal with these issues going forward? And it, this whole data ethics is, it's very complicated. But I think what I'm trying to say is we don't wanna only focus on past issues. We wanna think about what does this mean going forward when it comes to data sharing? Um, because it's gonna keep getting reinterpreted as we go forward in time. Yeah, Ian points out it there, it goes to scientific names as well. Oh, thanks, Karen. Thanks for your question. Are there other questions, thoughts? We only have a few minutes, but plenty of time to take, tackle a few more. You can hear more Tadwick stories, if not. Mm. <laughs> How about I'll do our small wrap up slide and then we'll have a little more time as people come up with things in the interim. Why not? Uh, okay. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, again, we'll have a little more time for questions after this, but um, According to UTC time, these are the sessions we have coming up tomorrow, um, really delving into the interest groups and workshops for the week. Um, we encourage you to join as many of these as you would like. Um, and most, they should all include a little bit of an overview at the beginning to introduce you to the work of the groups. Um, we also wanted to note as part of the structure of Tadwig and the executive committee, we do have elections coming up this year for a few positions. So something to consider. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. I guess I said this morning that uh, just to reiterate that we do have several positions uh, coming up every year we rotate through. Um, an important one this year, we uh, Deb, who will become chair next year, will need a deputy chair. So uh, Deb, Deb will need some help. Uh, and uh, I can't say, as I recall, exactly which, um, which groups turn over this year, but it's a real opportunity. Uh, we'll, of course, be advertising this very soon, um, but it's a real opportunity to uh, get involved. There's, again, there's no need to have been a Tadwig member for 15 years to be able to be on the executive. Uh, that It doesn't matter. All there is is enthusiasm. Uh, we need enthusiasm and people who are willing to commit. We're a volunteer organization, and uh, because of that, we need all the help we can get. So please consider. So a couple of new questions came in. Thanks, James. Um, hey. Oh, I have to find the questions again. Let me go back in the chat. It went away. There we go. I, Ian Engelbrecht asks us, what's the origin of the name Darwin Core? Who, who knows how it got named? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. All right. So um, Darwin Core was uh, a play on the Dublin Core. So uh, in all of sort of information science, there's been a tension between super elaborate and simple in terms of specifications that uh, enable people to share data. And in the library community, they have been working with the Mark standard and doing all these things. And then the internet came along and um, you know, there was a tendency for things to get crazy, 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 uh, elaborate. And a group of people in the library community or in the information science community said, you know, we, we need to just get some things simple so that people can find this understandable. And they said, we need to create just a max of 10 fields. And then it was expanded to 15 fields. And they, anyway, at the meeting, which happened in Dublin, Ohio, not in Dublin, Ireland, the term was was coined Dublin Core. Well, when we came upon that same tension in biodiversity, um, we just some. Uh, uh, it was Alan Allison at the at the Bishop Museum <laughs> said we need to have a Darwin Core. So that's where it came from. That was probably about 1998, I think. 
Thanks, Dan. That was fun. Yep, and we do have another question from Kate. What are the benefits of Tadwig membership at individual rather than institutional level? I can rattle off some, but I don't know. How, what about other people instead of me first? Go for it. So for me, it was always, I think I'm a person who's, well, everybody, they're gonna smile at me when I say this. I'm very interested in process. How the heck does this stuff happen? If you show me a research paper and it says we did X and they show you the results, I wanna know how they got there. So for me, this working with collections, um, I wanted to understand where did the standard come from and how did they decide and, and how, what if I can't find a bucket to put it in, where do I go? And so as part of the software development project I was part of, um, I began to get introduced to that. That what is a Darwin core standard and where, you know, where do I talk to that community and who are they? And as I began to learn more, I realized that was my happy place. Like somebody who wants to work in a research lab, I wanted to understand, I understood the collections part, but I wanted to understand the data part. And so Tadwig gives you that opportunity to intersect where I was showing, as someone asked the earlier question about the databases, if I'm a collection manager and I'm working with a database in my collection and I, oh, I don't like this database, it doesn't have the fields I need, it makes me so mad, what's wrong? You want to see an evolution where somebody looks at their database and goes, oh, you know, hmm, I wonder if there's a field for this in Darwin Core or I wonder what we could do. And then they go and ask other collections, hey, do you need this term, this field as well? And then they go to their biodiversity informatics manager or whatever and say, hey, we need this, this field who says, well, at Darwin Core, there's two to choose from or there isn't one. So you need that connection between you're sitting at trying to do that work in the collections and the people who give you those standards, but there has to be this bridge between those two worlds. And Tadwig gives me that. So it gives me a place to ask questions and people have answers. So that's what I like about Tadwig from an, an individual point of view. And many, many people in this room will smile when I say that because they know I've gone to them where I've gone to uh, Paul Morris or I've gone to James or I've gone to Holly or Paula or Gail or Stan. I could, I could list and list and list um, where I have these questions and it's a place to find answers and a place to find community. So. Other people, your turn. If we want to talk uh, value for money, the, the most tangible thing we can say there is that uh, for our journal, the reason we created our journal is to try to get more of our kind of people, the biodiversity informaticians, to feel comfortable publishing in a place that makes sense. A lot of times our things are published in various journals uh, on the fringes and it's hard to discover things. Uh, and so we thought, well, both to support our conferences and have those abstracts, our, our, um, our collections every year, but also for publishing. And uh, we do offer, we have a, uh, we made a deal with Pensoft. Uh, and so as a, as a uh, Tadwig member, you get a uh, fairly significant discount in publishing. And those of you who publish in the open these days know that uh, it's a ripoff uh, and very expensive to publish uh, in the open. So uh, at least this is a, a friendly place that uh, I think the price is a little more reasonable, if that's a plug. There must be others benefits that you find from Tadwick. I like being able to come to someone with a question about a problem I'm having and recognizing that a lot of people have the same problem with their data and being able to chat about it and make us come up with a solution. I'll make a plug. If you are in the earth sciences or paleobiology, the interest group tomorrow is mostly about that. Just comparing notes on how we're dealing with our data and trying to map it. <laughs> oh, yes. And speaking of which, because you get me very excited in that, oh, Paula, community therapy, yes. Um, one thing that's another uh, pet 
topic of mine is these control vocabularies, these drop downs that we have in our databases. And until the aggregation of millions and millions of records, it hasn't been that easy. If you were, and, and to use Holly's example, if you're, a, how many of you here are paleontology? Can you put a bang in the chat? How many of you are affiliated with paleontology collections? Let's just see how many paleo people we have in here. So again, you can imagine the number of duplication of, of items in that database when it comes to like stratigraphic layer information, things like that. So if you could share all that data and you could use the same terms, then you would save a lot of headaches when you're trying to share your data and researchers would save a lot of headaches when they try to go to use the data, right? And so you can take the aggregated data is the short story find all the distinct values that paleo people use in a given column, then get a bunch of paleontologists together in collections and look at that information and go, oh, can we derive from this an agreed upon set of terms that can make this data more standard in the future? And all the communities need to do that. Um, but the paleo community is taking that on right now. And I'm very excited because, yes. <laughs> oh, and cool, we have diatom questions going on there. Do diatom people hang out with geology people? I don't know. Do they? Ah. Okay. So Gail's point is that we, we cross domains, which we do. In, fact, we are, in fact, we couldn't do it without it. I mean, that's the reality. Yep. Um. Gail suggested that we might ask everyone to turn on their videos and take a picture. We didn't think to do that this morning, but. <laughs> okay, can somebody else do the screenshots this time? Or somebody else might have a bigger monitor than I do to make this easier. I had to do it in four pieces last time. I okay. always get it wrong, so I am not gonna do it. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, I, I can. can. Oh, oh, Gail, you can. Okay. Yeah. That's great. So tell I it's I think it's going to be in two two stages. Okay. But I'm I'm cuz I have two pages of of people. You, right. But great. there are So are we ready? Sure. Oops. Just Crap. tell us when. Wait a minute. Yay. Fromage. Fromage. Okay. And we've got people in the second one. Okay. Queso. Yum. Okay. Geza. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. I think I got two. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So do we have any, any final questions or thoughts or information we left out? <laughs> We're around all week. If you come up with something else, um, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh -huh. And for so various for various other things. <laughs> yeah, for all of you, remember all of us are, I mean, again, about bridging gaps. So you have expertise in your community that we don't we don't have and can't know about unless you tell us. So we are at that intersection and you, you can bring that to the table, making the, the local to global um, better for everybody. So do uh, stay in touch, make connections between your organizations and ours and let us know how we can help you. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, I really enjoyed this session this morning and this one. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us to speak on the topics about what TADWIG is, what our conference is, and who helped out with making sure we are running smoothly today. Hope everyone enjoys the rest of our first week of TADWIG and comes back in October. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. That was Thanks amazing. Thanks very much. Yes. Wonderful.